I was in Papua New Guinea a couple of years ago, and this was a very interesting experience for me because I'm an Aussie boy and I'm not used to this sort of thing happening. So I went up there and I was to do a, a, an outreach, uh, a big outreach in a place called Lai. No, probably not too many of you have been to Lai. It's in the northern kind of part of Papua New Guinea on a beautiful harbour. And it's the second biggest city in Papua New Guinea. So I went up there to do this outreach, turned up, was surprised when I got there because this outreach was across three great big Aussie rules field and they built a great big stage up the front. And I, f I found that amazing. Uh, I didn't realise it was so big. And so... On the first night, we got there and it was to begin at 7 o'clock and I got there at 4 o'clock and as I'm uh, walking toward the stage, a little bit overawed by it because I was, well I was coming from Warunga, well, this is when I was a pastor at Warunga and, and so that is a, a pretty big church of six or 700 or more but this was going to be thousands. In fact, we think that at this program there was anywhere between 30 and 50,000 so you get an idea of how many people were there. and So we're walking there into the uh, arena, the three Aussie Rules football fields, and as we're walking in, there was an old caravan there. And one of the pastors said, oh, I'd like you to come. We've got, a, we've got a little meeting going in on this caravan. So I said, OK. And I was a bit dubious because the caravan was only about, I don't know, three or four metres, 12 foot long. It's just a little one. I can remember the colour. It was green. And so I walked across with them to the caravan. I thought, man, I don't want to go in there. But anyway, that's where the meeting was. They opened the door and I squashed in. And it seemed like there was about 30, and I'm sure it wasn't, but it felt like there was about 20, 30 Papua New Guinea women in that caravan. And you know what they were doing? This is three hours before the program started. They were praying. And so I went in there, and Lay is a hot place. Um, beautiful place, actually. But I went in there, and there's a lot of sweat, and there's a lot of... <sighs> A lot of heat and a lot of prayer going up from out of that caravan to heaven. Well, over the next few days, I watched the ladies in this caravan. They get there three or four hours before the program. They pray. I don't know why they prayed in the caravan. I suggested we move it to a tent, but they never seemed to take that up. So they're in this caravan. I didn't know there was a caravan in all of New Guinea, but here it was. So they're in this caravan, they're praying. And they'd pray three or four hours before the program, they'd pray through the program, they'd pray up to two hours after the program. What are they praying for? They're praying for the program, they're praying for the people coming, they're praying for me. So I've never been into a, a program where there was so much prayer from such a small group of people and it was so powerful. And I could feel it. So the first night you turn up and there's 50,000, I don't know, there. It was just thousands and thousands. Some amazing things happened while I was up there in that actual particular program. That's the one where uh, uh, a guy turned up in a black Cadillac in the middle of the program. He gets out of the Cadillac, kind of floats across the ground in front of these thousands of people and stood before me who was preaching and went like that. Well, when he did that, the sound went off completely off, which I thought was really weird. And then people started to throw things at him. And I didn't really cotton on what was going on. And so I began to pray. And as, as we're beginning to pray and the people are throwing things at him, he kind of scoots forward and then disappeared, almost floating underneath the stage. And he and the Cadillac just disappeared like that. There's a truth. Wow. He actually turned up on the last night. That's when I saw him again. And he turned up with a shotgun in the same black Cadillac. There's not a black Cadillac in all of Papua New Guinea. He turned up in a shot, with a shotgun, gets out with a shotgun, and they hustled me into a car and off and away. And that was how I said goodbye in that program. But it was an amazing program because it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Uh, the news came in. There was a, and, I, and I say this in all respect uh, um, and, and with some integrity, but there was a, a big Pentecostal church and they're our brothers and sisters in the, in the cause of Christ. They are. Uh, but they, you know, uh, uh, I guess were feeling a little bit threatened by this big Adventist program and so they decided to, to run a program at the same time. So they've got a bit of a different style of music than us, you know, and we'd be getting ready to rev up on our side of the field. And they had the church, their church, which was right on the edge there, and they began to uh, uh, do their program, and you'd hear their music wafting across. They lasted three nights, and then they gave up and came to our program too. At the end of our program, they actually... Uh, I made a call for those who'd like to follow Jesus, particularly the Sabbath and accept some of the fundamental great truths that 
are in Adventism, which is why I'm an Adventist preacher. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty unapologetic about that. I love the fact that Adventists believe in the second coming of Jesus. I, I love the fact that we believe in righteousness by faith, what I was talking about this morning, as uh, the bedrock and the foundation of who we are. I, I love the Sabbath. The Sabbath is one of the best things we've got going for us. And we don't own it. Jesus said it was made for man, and it's a great time, the Sabbath. Look at us today, having a wonderful time. Amen. And so I, 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 I like being an Adventist and it, it warmed my heart when I made a call for them to, to follow Jesus and, and think about joining us when the entire church with the pastor came forward and he became a seven-day Adventist pastor later on, later on which, was, which was a great victory for the Lord, especially when you believe, as I do, in the movement that I belong to. So we're having a fantastic time up there on the third night. And this is what I wanted to tell you. Something's going on. I'm going to tell you what happened. I'm going to give you a Bible text and I'll give you a challenge. On the third night, I got there early again at about four o'clock and I didn't go into the caravan because the pastor, who was the leader of the church up there, the president, called me across. And there was about 30, because it was a regional program, a re big regional outreach, and there's about 30 pastors sitting around the circle cross legged. So I sat down and they all had pretty stern looks on their, their faces. Um, now, I noticed a phenomena when I was up there before I tell you what happened. After the program, people would come up to talk to me. And they'd come up to talk to me in their own local language, which would be like you, Praveen, talking to me in... Do you speak Hindi? Do you speak that at home? English. Between you, you two, yeah. It'd be like you're trying to... Or Liska trying to talk to me in... in um, I was going to say Jamaican, but it's Indonesian, isn't it? <laughs> it's all right, it's after lunch, I'm getting tired. <laughs> and go home for a sleep after this. And then I've got to get ready for a wedding on, on Monday up in Brisbane. Uh, not Brisbane, Sun Gold Coast. My nephew's getting married. Anyway, getting back to the story. Um, I don't know how it went off. Yeah, so they'd come up to me. They'd, they'd be almost jabbering away to me in their own language, and I didn't understand it. And I'd say, well, look, I'm sorry. And I thought it was pretty reasonable. I only speak English, and if you want to speak to me and get some common sense out of me, you better speak English. And they'd get a bit annoyed. A number of them would walk away quite frustrated. I'm scratching my head and think, that's pretty unreasonable. You know, I don't, and, and where I was, there might have been a half a dozen different dialects or more. So, and I, I don't speak pigeon. I don't speak, no, I can't even understand pigeon. Some people can, I can't. Um, so they call me 30 pastors around in a circle, sitting cross legged on this great big stage, and I sat down with them. This is what he told me. I'll never forget this. He said, I want to tell you what's going on here. 30, 40, 50,000, I don't know how many were there. He said, You're preaching in English, and they're hearing you in their own local dialect. This was on the television news up there. It was right across the city. And you know what that did to our program? It just got bigger. And I'm thinking, here I am, an Aussie boy. Now, the interesting thing was there was at least another half a dozen pastors up with me there on that trip scattered across Papua New Guinea. And another two or three of them experienced the same thing. And so I go home... And the thing that impacted me about that program was not the demon turning up in the black Cadillac. I've, I've had plenty of that up there and I couldn't care two hoots about those guys. I know God's more powerful. What impacted me, and, and maybe the demon is more sensational story, I don't know, but that's not what I concentrated on when I was coming home. I'm sitting in the plane and I'm thinking to myself, what happened there? What happened? Think about that for a minute. What happened there? That I was speaking in English and they were hearing me not in pidgin English but in their own local dialect. What's going on? Now this is not, I'm not talking a fantasy here, I'm not talking pie in the sky, this is a public meeting, these programs go out all over this area and all across the world. So I'm not lying. This went in the record. This happened. When I say the record, that's one of our church papers. It was in the newspapers on the local news up there. This happened. So what's going on? If you've got your Bibles, John chapter 3. And this is it. John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark, why did he come after dark? We don't know. 
After dark one evening he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Everywhere Jesus went there were miracles. He turned Israel upside down with his teaching and his miracles. You couldn't have been alive in those days living in Israel and not have heard of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Then Jesus replied, verse 3, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus goes into discussion with Jesus about what it means to be born again. Verse 5, Jesus replied, I assure you that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say to you, you must be born again. And then he says, the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can, can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Jesus said, if you want to go to heaven, this is Jesus. I cannot believe that we haven't spent more time on this passage of Scripture through the 160 years that our church has been around. Jesus said, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to be what? Born again. Now I want to put it to you that what happened up there in that big outreach in Lay was just about beyond me and almost superfluous to me. I'm an Aussie, I turned up there, I'm a pastor. I go there to preach. But what I walked into was a modern day Pentecost where 30 ladies or more or less, I don't know, in a caravan playing, th praying three hours before the program, during the program and after it, brought a blast of the Holy Spirit like I'd never experienced in my life and like most people in that area had never experienced. Those ladies were born again. They were born of the Holy Spirit. And what that means is the Holy Spirit was living inside of them. And through them, the Holy Spirit was able to come to that program through those ladies and their prayers and win thousands and thousands of people to the cause of Jesus Christ. And if you want to have a look at the early church, which in one generation, without television, without media, without internet, without evangelists, under severe and serious persecution... Of the 12 disciples, only one survived without a martyr's death, and that was John the Beloved. And there's, there's some evidence that he was put in a pot of oil by the emperor and didn't burn, so was sent to, to Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. He's the only one of the disciples that survived. I mean, Thomas got speared in India. James got hung, I think, upside down with Peter in Jerusalem. I mean, they, they died terrible deaths. Stephen was stoned. They died terrible deaths. The, the work was hard. You think it's difficult in Australia. It was hostile. They were imprisoned. They were beaten. They were, Paul goes through a list of things that happened to him as he's trying to share the gospel. But they did it in one generation because they were born again. And if the work is going to be finished in Taree for Jesus Christ and in Sydney and Australia, then it's only going to be finished by people who, are being, who have been born again. And the greatest weakness of the church is we have plenty of people who know the doctrines but are not born again. The greatest strength of the church is those who are born again. One born again Christian will, not can, will, trans, will completely transform. One born again Christian will completely transform a church. One born again church will transform a suburb, will transform Tari, Foster, Wingham, I think I'm getting this right, and Gloucester. One born again church. You want to see our movement explode in Australia? We can stop spending money. I can't believe I'm saying this, hunty. <laughs> on media evangelism. Because it's not, here you've got it from me. Look, look, we have, I'm, I'm, I, we have a big footprint for a little ministry. I told you, I think last night, one million plus people a week, millions a month we reach. We reach all of Australia. We're not going to finish the work. It's not going to be finished by Lloyd Grollam. It's not going to be finished by Gary Kent. It's not going to be finished by bigger players than us, Doug Batchelor and some of these guys in the United States of America who reach millions and millions and millions a day. 
it's not going to be finished by then. It's not, it's not, it's not. I get that, it's not. It's going to be finish the work. And what I mean by that, the story of Jesus to the world is going to be told by born again, ordinary people like you and me in churches, in towns, in suburbs and in nations all around the world. That's what's going to do it. If you want to see a revival in your church, in your town and in this area, you, don't worry about your neighbour, you go get born again. The problem with me is the born again experience. The problem with you is the born again experience. The problem in the church, and there's a problem, is the born again experience. When I go to Papua New Guinea, every time I go to Papua New Guinea, I walk into a fire of the Holy Spirit that's up there because of the people. Now, I'm not saying all the people up there have got it together either, but there's enough to start a raging bushfire up there like nothing I have ever seen. I have preached... In the Philippines, I have preached in America, I have preached through God's grace in Europe, I have preached in Australia, I have preached plenty in New Zealand, literally preached in every church in New Zealand and every town. I have never been to a place, including Asia and Africa, I'll tell you I preached in Africa too. I have never been to a place like Papua New Guinea because every time I go to Papua New Guinea, I walk, it's a blast furnace. I walk straight into a fire so hot that's going on because of the faithful people up there. People say to me, ah, well, Papua New Guinea, they're kind of different than Australia. They don't have the same things we do. Yes, they do. I go into a village up there and they've got a, a television connected up to Foxtel watching the same rugby league football that we do. And by the way, isn't it good to be a Queenslander at the moment? <laughs> they've got all the same influences, all the same technologies up there, but there are people and there's enough of them that are born again that the work is just kaboom. And I can't believe we don't hear more about this in the church. Never been to a place like Papua New Guinea. But it's because people are born again. Some of them don't have the doctrinal understandings we do. They're living simpler lives. They don't have the resources we do, but they have the resource we don't. And that's the Holy Spirit. You know, when we have the Holy Spirit, when we're born again in our churches, our churches are no longer fighting you know what I mean when churches fight within themselves? I've been a pastor for 33 years. I know the gig. Board meetings and business meetings between it, that goes. When you're born again, your entire, your entire uh, uh, focus is on Jesus and what you can do for Jesus to advance Jesus' kingdom. I mean, those 30 ladies, do you think they wanted to sit in that caravan in that heat for six hours a day? Well, actually, I think they did want to sit in that caravan, that heat for six. But they're in prayer. And when you're in prayer and you're praying for the Holy Spirit, guess what happens? He turns up. And when the Holy Spirit turns up, big things happen. And I just got caught in the middle of it. I like to think I brought the Holy Spirit with me, but I didn't. He was there waiting for me. And he used me, but he used me because of the power of what those ladies were doing in that caravan. And I could talk to you about experience after experience after experience up there of the power of the Holy Spirit. When it comes to be born again. So I'm going to close. And this is the most important thing I'll say all day. If the born again experience is so important, how do you get it? If you've got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 11. <coughs> Luke chapter 11. Jesus leaves us with no excuse. This is so simple. The small child would understand it. Luke chapter 11, I'm going to start in verse 9. I'm just going to read it straight. Sometimes there, there comes a time sometimes as a pastor, as a preacher, you need to just read the Bible. I'm going to read it straight. doesn't matter what version you're from. I've checked them all. I all say the same thing. Verse 9 of Luke chapter 11. You ready, hunty? And so I tell you, says Jesus, this is Jesus talking. So I tell you, Keep on asking, you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the, and the door will be open to you. For everyone, look at what Jesus is saying. For everyone who asks, receives. 
Everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Now here we get to the crux of the matter, verse 11. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not, I'm a father. My daughter, by the way, came this morning. Hallelujah, praise God. Of course not, verse 13. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, now watch it, watch it, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask. Father in heaven, I'm here, I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask for Jesus to be my saviour. And I dare to come to you in the name of Jesus and to ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And when you ask, he comes. I'll invite these guys forward. And then I'll say something and we'll finish to sing one last song. This is a special song. I think you'll enjoy it and then we'll close. There's a love song
I was going to make Liz go up and sing it again, but we better. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, look, this whole series, Friday night, last night, we looked at number one the fact that if you're in the boat, Jesus will carry you through the times we're in. So you're in the boat with Jesus. You've surrendered your life to him, you're in the boat. This morning we looked at how you can hear the voice of God. So you're in the boat and you're hearing the voice of God. And then we looked at how you are saved. So you're in the boat, you're hearing the voice of God and you know how you're saved. And then we looked at this afternoon the Holy Spirit. So you're in the boat, you're hearing the voice of God, you know how you're saved and you're full of the Holy Spirit. It's wonderful, isn't it? That's how it works. That's how you'd be ready for Jesus to come. Um, I'm going to get Liska to go to the door as we close. And she's got these little cards we give out wherever we go. Well, they're brand new, actually. You're the first to ever get them. And I'd love to invite you to take one as you leave. And if you're online, go online and join our Facebook page. We love it when we have believers like you guys helping to share us our, our messages that goes around the whole world. We spent a lot of money on Facebook and starting to on YouTube to get our messages out. If we could just get people to share, we wouldn't have to spend any, wouldn't have to spend any money there. That would be a good thing, amen? You know Doug Batchelor? You know how he gets his message out around the world? He doesn't have a very big church, did you know that? But his church, every time he puts something on, guess what they do? They all share and it goes ballistic. You want to see the power of sharing? Have a look at a thing we did the other day. I was showing last night on the Titanic and Noah's Ark. It's now had about 15,000 shares and 30,000 likes and it's the shares that get it around the world. So I'd love you to invite you to take a card, phone number if you ever want to talk to me or us there. Um, you, it's our Facebook and our YouTube pages you can go to and you can see what we do. It's been a privilege to be here with you. I did mean to say when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you know, I talked about hearing the voice of God uh, um, and, and how 99.5% of it is in the Bible. The other 0.5% is when the Holy Spirit comes to you. You pray for him to come into your heart. You pray morning and night for the Holy Spirit to come in your heart. I'll guarantee that he'll start to talk to you almost instantly and he'll be telling you what he doesn't want in, his life, in your life and what he does. And it's very challenging. Do what he says. And you'll be on fire and your life will explode. You'll know why you're here. You'll have a reason. You'll be complete. And you'll be a firebrand for Jesus Christ. Amazing stuff. Okay, so Lizzie, if you can go to that front door, uh, take, take one card as you go, um, and we'll pray to finish. Thank you so much for coming too. Appreciate it a lot. Dear Lord Jesus, you're a good God. We're big sinners. We have a bigger saviour. And we close again by asking him to come into our hearts. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins and we ask for the blessing and the infilling and the dwelling and the possession of the Holy Spirit. May that be the experience of every person here, I pray, so that they can in these last days shine bright for you in the darkness. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless and Maranatha.